We'll just hand it off to Christoph. Okay. All right. And this is what, like 10 to 15 minutes of chit chat on what Bill asked me to do? Yes, please. All right. So let me do a quick screen share. Where is the button for that? Start screen sharing. Entire screen, this guy. Okay. So uh, Bill and I are friends on Facebook. Um, for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Christoph. I was part of Blue for uh, 15 plus years when I lived up in the Boston area. Um, but anyway, so I'm I'm in Texas now, and um, I went on a little eclipse journey a couple weekends ago. Or was it was it just last weekend? No, it's two weeks ago. Uh, but in any case, I'm living here in Dallas. We were in the path of totality. Uh, we had forecast for some crummy weather, so wife and I decided last minute that we were going to go shoot outside of um, Hot Springs. I found a little campground out there. Uh, I'll show you some images. So this is basically the rig that I'm going to talk about here today, just to kind of say I'm not an astrophotographer. This is like the first time I picked up a gadget like this and pointed it at the sky. So I had about two afternoons of practice just to track the sun and pretend like a, that this was going to work. And then it all turned out to work pretty good. So I'll talk more about the setup here in just a second. But just to kind of show some of the images, this is we'll just go straight to kind of one of what I think is one of my better images. Um, and this is uh, what we call um, Earth shine. So yeah, it's the eclipse in totality. Um, but we're also capturing some of the light that's reflected off the Earth back onto the moon, so you can actually see some of the moon's surface in there. So that's kind of my personal favorite. Um, there's plenty of other ones. I did not, you know, I was fully aware that when people photograph the eclipse, you want to catch the pearls. There's all these, you know, special miniature events that you can get. Um, I wanted to make sure that I was witnessing the eclipse more so than photographing it. So my focus was look up and allow my setup to kind of do its own thing. Um, and one of the things you might notice here on the top of my setup, I had a, a Ninja V um, video recorder so that the um, HDMI output from my camera, which was just outputting the display of the camera, it wasn't actually set in video mode but that was recording everything that was coming through the camera. So I have a video recording to fall back to for some of this stuff, but obviously every time I touched the button to take a picture, the video recording would show the picture that was just taken. So it's just basically showing the display. So that was the kind of the setup that I put up. Um, the event that we went to, the space that we found, uh, we it turned out to be a motocross like go-to place so this is some family that's got 200 acres out in the middle of arkansas and their property is typically you know five bucks to go ride your motorcycles all weekend um, but they had a, a patched area out there that they reserved for um, people that wanted to camp and bring their rvs so that's exactly what we did so we paid 100 bucks for a day to sit there and have a spectacular view of this um this event so back to this guy so this, uh, you know what, let me stop presenting, stop sharing. So that is this setup here behind me. And I'll bring it up front so we can talk about it a little bit. And I can also maneuver my camera to let you guys see this a little bit better. So this is the um, Skywatcher Star Adventurer GTI. And this is pretty much a, um, a point and let it go type of device. Um, when you first set it up, you know, first time you set it up, you have to, you know, point this guy at Polaris, so the North Star, you have to adjust everything. So there's a, a little rectangle inside that gives you a bullseye to basically put Polaris in the right spot. And then once this is aligned, then you release the clutch on the camera, it rotates, and then basically you use the app on a cell phone to talk this thing over Wi-Fi, and you just hit a button and you say, you know, let me watch this constellation or take me to this thing, and then it moves the camera and takes you to the right place and drives it right to you. Um, I've only got a tiny lens on this right now, just for example, you saw in the picture that, you know, I had a 200 millimeter to 600 millimeter, I'd say ideally for star, for like sun photography, like the eclipse, Maybe you want a 400 millimeter to 500. So 600 is way too zoomed in. 
you weren't going to get all the uh, the solar flares and everything like that. Um, about I'd say about four to five hundred is max what you'd want. But anyway, so I bought this device. It came with the tripod. It came with this extra neck. Uh, it holds 11 pounds of gear on here. Um, I already had a bunch of uh, small rig gears to, you know, outfit my cameras for video and junk. So I already own the Ninja V, so it was easy for me to conceive how this is going to work like that. Um, the only thing I didn't have and what the, um, the rig didn't come, when, come with was this uh, plate to make sure I'm pointing at the right thing here this extra plate on the bottom to mount this. This is not your standard camera plate. So uh, I forget what the um, what the specific title of this uh, mounting plate is. It has a, a, a special name for the size and everything that goes in there. Um, but once you have that, super easy, you put it together. Like I said, you align it once, maybe the night before uh, with the night with the North Star, just so you can know in general what direction you're pointing. And then just to have it point to the sun or the moon and track it, um, it's easy enough just to come back the next day. As long as you haven't changed the um, the altitude of this thing, you just point it, you know, at the same tree or whatever, you know, landscape uh, uh, marking you can point it at. And then uh, you just point this thing, and then you basically release the clutch. You point it at the sun, and then you have to go in the app, and obviously you also have to tell it. I, I authorize you to track the sun because if you don't have a filter on, the sun basically treats your lens like a magnifying glass and it'll cook your electronics. So never point a device like this zoomed in on the sun. It'll just melt your stuff. So filter on, acknowledge that you want it to track the sun. You hit the track button and then it's you don't have to worry about it anymore. So as the sun moves across the sky, this guy keeps it right in the center of the frame. And that allowed me just to kind of sit in there and stare at the sky and hit the button and and, um, and take the pictures that you kind of saw there a second ago. Um, Cost-wise, I think these things are sale priced around 600 bucks. Um, I plan to do a lot more astrophotography simply because I, I do quite a bit of camping. Uh, and so it's a nice thing to do in, the, in the, at night. And I've always just used tripod and, you know, long exposure photography. But now I want to track stuff and get a little bit more enter some uh get into some nebula photography and, and deep sky object stuff so that's that plan um i think uh if i just want to summarize like um what went well like it this setup did everything that i needed it to do um i came away with a lot of photographs that i thought were in the same category of some of the best photographs i've seen other people do um clearly with you know more gear, more time, more preparation. If I really spent my time focusing on the photography, I could have probably done better photographs, but I would have missed the event. So worked great, really happy with it. Uh, things that I probably could have planned and maybe missed the opportunity to do. Um, I had this guy on order. So this is a digital timer to basically plug it in the camera and then you just set it up, take a picture every 10 seconds, 30 seconds, every second, whatever. And then it would have really been a no brainer. Um, and the other thing that I probably should have done ahead of time is set the camera up for bracketing. Um, if you're not familiar with that term, what all, what bracketing does is when you push the, um, the, the button to take a picture, uh, with bracketing enabled, it'll actually take three to five pictures, but every picture will get a different set of settings to basically move from um, maybe a lower aperture to a higher aperture. So that basically you capture more of the same images at different settings and then you can compress those in Lightroom and do some post-processing to really beef up your um, your uh, your high definition, or you know, get that uh, that broad spectrum of, of light in your in your images. Um, so yeah, so those are kind of the two things I, I wish I would have had a little bit more time to set up and get familiar with. But yeah, digital timer and, and doing bracketing, and I do plenty of other stuff where I use those things, but it just didn't dawn on me. And I, at the at the last minute, I wasn't going to change my routine because I didn't want to screw up everything. Um, anything that I really screwed up is like, no. Oh, uh, one other thing that came in super useful is, uh, I took all the batteries out of my gizmos. And so even the, the battery in the, the camera is one of these guys. So, and you can get these for pretty much any type of camera. Uh, this is a dummy battery that basically just replaces the, where, where the battery goes with USB power. 
Uh, this guy happens, this is from my, uh, my APS-C, which is a smaller camera, so it works on five volts just fine. Uh, this one needs eight volts. So I plug this guy into uh, USB-C, and then it has a, a, a step in um, a, a power converter to basically deliver eight volts to this battery, to, to this camera. Um, so these specialized cables, these are all available on Amazon, eight to 15 bucks, something like that. Um, and then the Ninja V just uses a standard 12-volt uh, battery. And I plugged all these guys into this turkey, which is a, a Blue Eddy EBB or EB3A. So this is like the, the, the kind of the king of what's on sale on Amazon right now. Uh, and you get about the, let's say, 275, somewhere between 270 and 300 um, amp hours. Um, but king, the key thing here is it's got DC out. It's also got a um, cigarette lighter, uh, three USB ports, and it also do like your traditional ports there. Um, but what was king about this guy or what was key is that when you turn it on, it stays on. Uh, a lot of battery packs like this have like auto off features. And these guys don't draw enough power to basically convince this thing that it needs to stay on. Or this one worked fine, but the other ones that I went through. So I went through like three other ones where I was testing this stuff and it would all just turn off after five minutes of being on. And it's because the, the battery thought it knew better. So it just turned itself off. So any case, that's the setup. That's the gear. It was a ton of fun. Um, this is a Wi-Fi enabled device. It also has a USB plug. So at some point in the future, I will be cabling it directly to a PC. You can probably do some more creative stuff instead of having to work through an app. But the app was super easy to do. Um, when you first align it, it basically has full step-by-step -step pointed at this, put Polaris in the reticle at this point, and now it'll kind of drive you to some other star that's supposed to be visible in your area and you align that. So you do like two or three alignments to get it really dialed in. And then after that, you've got the entire catalog, everything in the phone. You're just like, oh, I wanna look at this thing tonight and it just turns and does it. So it's pretty cool. I love it. It's a lot of fun. Questions? So th that's actually one of the things I was gonna ask you about was registration. I mean, it it doesn't know you're lat long basically, but, but it knows you're in the Northern hemisphere. The phone? Does your uh, GPS and it calculates exactly where you, where you need, to, need to point things to. Oh, okay. So as good yeah. as your GPS is, it'll get that. All right. Yeah. And you know, as long as you learn how to find the North Star, right? So if you look at the Big Dipper, you take two stars of the Big Dipper and you align those, it'll point you right at Polaris. So if you know that golden rule, then you really don't even need that because you just find it and uh, dial it in yourself. Okay. And uh, for daytime, uh, you know, star and moon tracking, you just have to, you're, you're good enough pointing it at magnetic north. So it doesn't even have to be that, that uh, accurately, you know, aligned. So, but, you know, and those things you can also do with your, your regular old compass or, you know, I can't get my phone compass to point north. Like that's the weirdest thing ever. So I don't rely on that for this, but yeah, that was it. That, uh, Cool gadget it was a lot of fun. Uh, made for a lot of good talking points. And, you know, a lot of people showed up with some really expensive gear, uh, big telescopes, and were doing things that were you know beyond my skill set and my knowledge of astrophotography. But you know, walking into this blind as a newbie, I couldn't be happier with what I walked away with. Thanks, Chris. Very interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Chris. All right. Well, next. So Elliot, do, should we put Elliot on? If he's Elliot's got some slides. Sure. I am here. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yes, perfect. Sir. All right. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm juggling a little bit since Kurt and I are also attempting to co-organize this as a uh, HPC GPU meetup group. So. I'm going to try sharing my screen and let's see if that works. Um, Francisco, we'll probably put you on after Elliot. It, I might be having this thing where it makes me restart Chrome. Oh, oh boy.
Kurt, I, I think have Francisco go because I'm going to have to fiddle with my system here. Okay. Is that okay, Francisco? Yep. You're good. Okay, cool. Let me just turn it up a little. Sure. Let me see if I can share my screen. So, this shouldn't be too much. Yeah. All right. All right, how's that rendering? Does that look all right? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, good. All right, cool. All right, well, um, yeah, I just want to talk about the single board closure competition that we're organizing. So as some of you are familiar, just being people around the SE conference or maybe graduates of the student or like alumni of the student cluster competition, uh, maybe you participated. I know that Kirk Cavill is a mentor for that. And I mean, that he also went there last year for, uh, what was it, Colorado? Denver. And this was just something that we thought would be easier to get to because usually there's such a high wall for students to get into just what goes into a cluster where application benchmarks, the whole ordeal of just HPC in general. So last year we organized something just between our community colleges and um, also just another university that we had nearby. Um, in order to just keep it more accessible to others, we decided to employ a power limit and a cost limit, as well as just we have some more limitations just to make it easier for others. And uh, as is in the name, single board cluster competition, the aim is not to use full like full nodes that you would see in a data center, but instead something that is easier to find, like an orange pie, a raspberry pie, a rock pie. These that are like commercially available to people. So uh, last year, what we used just to benchmark and grade was just the typical HPL, right? The high performance lean pack, also uh, HPCG, which are which up to this year were like standards for the student cluster competition at the SC conference. Actually, it's a little bit of trivia. Uh, HPCG has been swapped for ML Perf, the machine learning benchmark. So it's it's kind of interesting to see a change in that. But anyways, some other stuff we had was the Intel MPI benchmarks just to measure uh, just like the network aspect. And especially if you have a lot of single boards, it, it's something that incentivizes students to have multiple just uh, boards. And then the final one was Graph 500, which was based on creativity, just see what implementation students come, come up with. So this was last year, and the students that participated came from UCSD, so that's our school, uh, Alberg Universität, which is in Denmark, and Pasadena City College. And we held it here at UCSD, uh, and it was kind of a one-day event to just see if we could chug everything out. Uh, it was overall it was a lot of fun, too, especially because we got to have everyone host, like hosted here in person. Now, this year we have been organizing something very similar. This year we're having our team, uh, Alber Universität, which again from Denmark, and will be uh, participating remotely. Uh, UT Austin or people from Texas Advanced Computing Center who are here and helping us organize again in person, and students from University of Kansas. Now. The students from the University of Kansas, they participated at the student cluster competition. And for them, just it's also a way to um, just further their skills in HPC. And this year, it's, it's kind of the rules that, very similar to the rules that we get most years, or last year, since last year was our first year, which is a 250 watt limit, which usually keeps the cost down, a $6,000 limit just for total amount of hardware and, and resources. Um, a minimum of four sockets and to be able to run MPI just to make sure that people are bringing in a cluster. Then again, some also just some more specific rules like no M1, M2, or M3 chips. Um, yeah, we wanted to have, we also try to aim for participating physically, so in person, and we gave a limit of, of eight max students per team. And also, we this year we're employing a, a no axiom in the cluster, which even though that does setting up remote access is a, a feature of most HPC clusters, also with scheduling and how how programs are, or applications are supposed to run after each other and, and so they don't conflict. So, all right. Uh, this year we're also splitting up, we're dividing, um, we're still keeping HPL and HPCG, 
but we switched out our Intel API for a Q20. This was actually suggested by Kurt Cavill to uh, Benjamin Lee, who was helping, who's actually, I, I believe he's here and he's helping organize this as well. And we're also keeping a mystery app just to see how, how well students know their cluster and are able to add another application on the spot. Okay. Yeah, we're splitting up into three days. So Thursday, tomorrow will be our first day. And actually, this is why you see a lot of us setting up the room today. And that's why we have our camera um, as just us setting up some stuff. Tomorrow will be where they can come in, set up their hardware, make sure that everything works, maybe do some testing. And Friday will be the first day, which will be the benchmarking and making sure that they can give some results as what their cluster is for HPL and HPCG. And around midday, around like 12 p.m., we plan on releasing what sort of problems we want them to solve for the Cube 20. Again, that's the Rubik's solver and also the mystery application that we have. And then after that, they'll have um, re the rest of the working hours of that day and the following day up until three to submit their applications. And at two hours after that, we, well, we plan to give them a, a few tours around UCSD, the campus, um, and our expand supercomputer. And two hours after that, at 5 p.m., give them the results. So, yeah, that's pretty much a quick summary of it. I appreciate your time. Are there any questions? So are you going to make this, is, is this going to be an annual event, uh, Francisco? Um, and is it always going to be the same time of the year? Well, hopefully we'd like it to be. I mean, it's it's a way for um, groups that cannot afford the process of going to SEC or maybe even indie SEC to just get in more into just yeah, high performance computing in general. So we'd like it to be that. This is the second year and our mentor, Mary, has been pushing for a student-led program like this or competition for a while now. So it actually, I guess as a plug, if you know any group that might be interested then this would be a good thing to, it, it would be helpful if you could contact us at some point after this, either me or Benjamin Lee or someone similar, maybe even Kurt. Uh, I'm sure he can forward you my contact info. Absolutely. Okay. Anyone else, or should we, or should we pass off to Elliot? Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks, Francisco. All right. Uh, so, can I take over screen sharing? Let me see. Uh, <clears throat> All right, how does that look, folks? That's good. That's okay, good. I'm I'm having enough technical difficulty. I'm not going to try and make this complicated. Okay, so I, I didn't have a chance to de uh, de enterprise these slides, so to speak. So so bear with me. I'll try and have a little bit of fun with them. Um, I'm going to recap GTC, which was Nvidia's has historically been Nvidia's Developers Conference. Um, stands for GPU Technology Conference. Uh, as you might imagine, there's a lot more AI there than there than there was in previous years. Um, it was it was a uh, really interesting, um, really exciting. A lot of I don't know a lot a lot of buzz, a lot of excitement. Everyone um, thinking about what AI can do and the technology that's enabling it. Um, so this is a photo of Nvidia CEO Jensen Wong. On the the left hand side, you see the new chip. And on the right-hand side, you see the uh, existing chip, which is the H100. So you you can see that that chip on the right, the H100, is about half the size, give or take, of the the new uh, Blackwell chip on the left side. Um, Nvidia, I guess, is uh, uh, famous at this point for building very large chips, uh, basically reticle size chips, the largest chip that can be that can be built, kind of all in one. And what's unique about Blackwell, and I'll, I can talk a little bit about that, is um, basically two of them being stitched together. 
so again, the kind of the biggest, most powerful chip that uh, that can be can be put on a die like that. Um, it's it's worth mentioning that uh, Nvidia is very well known for GPUs, but on the on the bottom you'll see uh, there's an Nvidia GPU, there's an Nvidia DPU, which is combining networking, uh, basically building an ARM CPU into a network card. So you have networking um, data path along with ARM cores that can um, work with data as it, as it flows. Um, and then NVIDIA has also built a CPU and a lot of that is all coming together now. Um, so known for hardware, but also a lot of software work. A lot of what NVIDIA does is actually the, the software, not the hardware. Um, CUDA is the maybe the most well-known, the most long-standing. Um, but NVIDIA is building libraries for all these things along the top. Um, so, so accelerated computing libraries for data processing, which is pretty general purpose. Um, a lot of engineering applications, which are a little more special purpose, computer-aided drug design, even more specific. Um, that is both kind of traditional simulation techniques as well as a lot of new AI now. There's a lot of excitement in life sciences uh, because biology is such a complex process that AI is going to enable an ability to uh, understand and reason about biology in a way that we just haven't been able to, to crack uh, through uh, uh, our own brain power and sweat. Um, similar on climate simulation, like five order of magnitude speed ups by using AI methods, some of the deep learning methods um, instead of traditional simulation techniques, kind of some similar stories in quantum, really interesting activities in robotics where people are training robots in virtual worlds before they operate in the real world, right? So you can have a robot try something and fall down like a million times um, before it learns how to do it the right way. It'd be very expensive to do that in the real world. You can do it in a day on a, in a virtual environment. So the robots learn how to move around in a, an environment that they believe is real, that's kind of virtually rendered real. Um, that the GPU can read the CPU's memory and vice versa at a much higher speed than is possible with some of the older style configs where you have a GPU card and you plug it in, um, plug it into a PCI Express slot. That works. It's getting faster generation after generation, but this is like seven times faster than the PCI Express connected GPUs. So anything you see GH or GB is uh, CPU and GPU tied together. And then um, fabric to connect all of that. And that's a that has been a big deal in HPC, right? We have high-speed fabrics. We've been doing that since the beginning of supercomputing. Uh, difference being that it turns out AI needs even higher levels of connectivity. So you might have one 400 gig link in your supercomputer to each node. Uh, but if it's an AI supercomputer, you probably have eight, 10, 12, 400 gig links to every single node. It's kind of wild. I'm gonna jump around a little bit. So the new the new chip, you can kind of see there's there's two dies glued together and there is a 10 terabyte per second link between the two dies and then there are also really high speed links to these gold things at the top and the bottom which are hbm memory so it's 192 gigs of memory on the blackwell uh, you basically use this as if it's a single gpu and you're getting 10 petaflops of fp8 which is used a lot for uh ai training um and potentially fp4 as well for training so you can build ais um at a at a very uh let's see you need the memory capacity to hold uh, a, a larger model and you also need both the memory performance and the compute performance to go along with that so you load all of the parameters into memory and then you can iterate that on them very rapidly if you look at this chart, you can see um, the performance for 175 billion parameter model, which is actually relatively small. GPT-4 is guessed to be like 1.8 trillion, so about 10 times this. And you can see kind of generation over generation the the performance of the various chips to to run inference on 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 this relatively small model. The larger the models get, the harder it is to fit them in any in any system. Um, 
And so you have to fit them to start, which needs the memory. And then you have to um, iterate on them both as your training as in your, and as your inferencing. Um, uh, let's see, let me, let me jump down to this. This is the new big system that's being built, which has two Blackwell chips plus a Grace CPU all connected. Uh, and those essentially go into back, a back plane. So this board, two of these boards are loaded into a one U tray and then they're connected by super high speed NVLink. Um, if you saw on the previous slide, Fabric is 400 gig right now going to 800 gig and that's gigabits, right? 400 gigabits, 800 gigabits. NVLink is 900 gigabytes per second. So we're talking an order of magnitude increase in the throughput of the fabric that connects the GPUs. And that's built up into this rack. It's a single rack that can hold a 27 trillion parameter model, which is essentially 10, 10 plus X larger than GPT-4. It's not really known exactly, you know, right? a lot of this stuff is not released yet, but the scaling laws have have largely held that the more parameters you put into an AI, the more capability it has. So getting another 10x capability in, in AI model size is uh, going to be very interesting to see what people do with that. So this is one rack, 120 kilowatts. A lot of uh, standard server racks, not that long ago, were 10 kW. This is, you know, 12x that. So all liquid cooled, 120 kilowatts. It's pretty hard to get that into most data centers. Massachusetts has a green data center, MGHPCC, with all the universities have collaborated on. So in Massachusetts, it will be possible to run one of these, but it is generally difficult to do so. Um, and so there's a few other things, right? If you can't do the 120 kW rack, you can do a, a slightly smaller version. These are under 20 kW. And then there's a version that fits all the way on the right here that fits um, kind of the existing form factors. Perhaps maybe I'll share one more thing, um, which is the idea of microservices, which is um, I think I think a little you know maybe very common in enterprise commercial. Um, you know, you think about cloud providers having quote unquote serverless services. Okay things like that. Um, the difference being... Judge, fast time. I'm not going to be closing, so let's go fast time. Sorry, there's some background noise. So the, the idea here is that um, increasingly, folks are going to build AI inferencing into all kinds of different things, certainly chatbots and things like that, right? But also uh, scientific workflows where they might be calling an LLM to work with textual data, but perhaps also a visual model, and perhaps also um, working with genetic data, uh, protein data, uh, mathematical data. There's there's a lot of a lot of work just come out in the last few months where folks are training the equivalent of ChatGPT only on DNA, right? So there's no there's no human text, it's just DNA text essentially. And they're promising results coming out of that, that you train it on just DNA and it can work with RNA, it can work with proteins. Um, so there are going to be scientific applications making uh, chatbot calls, if you want to think about that, and that's essentially inferencing. So you'll be able to, from your Python, uh, Python code, Python notebook, make calls into AIs, whether it's you know tech calling it for text summarization or text generation, calling it for coding, calling it for DNA, molecular type applications. Um, and there's some folks building quote unquote foundation models for science too, where you might be calling an AI to um, work with your data. Um, and so you can play around with this. You can go to ai.nvidia.com, try out a whole bunch of different models. Um, and um, there's a stand, there's a, we're building standard APIs so that you can easily flip out your models. Um, as, as new AI models are released, you'll be able to use the same API calls to call the new, new better models and, and be able to you know, build your various projects around all of those things. Uh, I think that's it. Um, I'd welcome questions. Were you out there for GTC, Elliot? I was, yes, I was. And I'll, I'll share a link. Um, so so there's, um, there's a whole keynote with all kinds of fun stuff. But um, 
if you if you watch that link on YouTube, you can see kind of all of this coming together where they, they show you the chip and then the chips come together and the NV switch comes in and you can kind of get the, the full thing. Um, what I've described here is probably only a tenth of, of everything that was was talked about at the conference. There was so much going on. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I had I, I sat in virtually and um, and yeah, there was a lot of NVIDIA adjacent stuff going on this year, too. It, you know, we had swapped an email about some of the Micron announcements that pretty, pretty fascinating stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yes. I also, yeah. I, I had I had Google Trends and Google Zeitgeist open during during GTC and I and who is Blackwell was the lead search. Ah, <laughs> yes, there is more than one Blackwell. There was a woman. I think she was in the medical sciences. Um, but but the official name is is for David Blackwell, who was a mathematician. Yeah. Uh, I did not know David before this, um, so I need to to spend more time looking at his bio. Well, it doesn't roll off the tongue like Volta and Ampere, and. Uh, <laughs> and for that matter, you know, Tesla and, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I think there's an effort to recognize, uh, scientists and thinkers that, um, haven't, haven't been as often recognized, which, which I'm glad for, like, like, uh, Grace Hopper, for example, she's, she's probably better known than, than David Blackwell, but, um, it's, it's good to, to, I think, remind ourselves of some of those stories. Yeah. A lot of people came before us. Yeah. Any uh, the ones the the ones that you attended? Any particular things stand out uh, for the lectures you attended? Yeah, good question. Um, well, I guess I kind of touched on robotics, but there is generally an impression um, among researchers that that suddenly we're seeing new things. You know, robotic research has been chugging along for decades, right? Um, but some of these new methods where they can um, develop robotics virtually before bringing them into the real world seems like that's really speeding up the pace of iteration and the expectation that there's going to be useful more useful robotics um, systems in the real world fairly shortly um, you know dr panda from ohio state was there um, they're still cranking along on this kind of merger of of networking and computing and and the more computing that happens in the network the more interesting efficiencies and optimizations you can do so they were talking about that um, in general the the grace hopper thing is very interesting the combi the the combination of the cpu and the gpu together um is is unlocking some interesting things so there are quite a few talks about that there are a number of supercomputers that have already been announced um, both in Europe and in the U.S., and I think maybe in Japan as well. Um, some of them fairly substantial. ULIC has a big, big system coming online that has an NVIDIA CPU and an NVIDIA GPU. Um, power efficiency is is a big part of that. It's much more power efficient than an x86-based platform, um, but the the linkage of the memories allows for some very interesting capabilities as well, both both from a traditional HPC, you know, simulation and modeling perspective, but certainly from an AI perspective as well, as these AI models get larger and larger, it's hard to fit them in memory. Yeah, I, I think there's some companies that are trying to move the, um, uh, what do you call that, Bill, the Overton window, like, you know, Microsoft saying that they need a $100 billion data center. I did right. see that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, AI is very capable, but um, current AI models are not as power efficient as the human brain. They may, it may, they may become more capable than the human brain from a from a uh, intelligence output perspective, but they need a lot of electrons moving through them to to get their work done. Yep. Yeah, I don't even know how you build a one. So so uh, so like you say, even even when you're next to a river in Western Massachusetts. 120 what'd you say 120 kilowatt per rack yes correct okay yeah uh, so i don't know how you do that with uh we'll have to bring an electrician in on our next discussion i mean what what, what is the code for that mghpcc is that i think they're already at 20 megawatts give or take right so 20 20 million watts already with headroom for more um so they can't do this thing that microsoft is talking about but they they and i was talking to, to some folks earlier today and they they can do some of these racks if if that's what they decide to do wow um they're already doing i think i think they've got 60 kw racks already running there with already clear ability to do 100 i guess so 120 isn't pushing it too much further it is it is kind of wild but um some of the big supercomputer sites have been doing this for a while um 
kind of the old Cray style, now HPE Cray. Um, they've been doing kind of full liquid cooling for a few generations now. So my understanding is it's it sounds wild to some, but there are already some centers that have been doing this for a little bit. Yeah, more a pod, right? Uh, so this would be a couple of racks or or is that a single rack? The 120 is a single rack. So you can do it as a single rack. Um, if you watch the YouTube link I, I showed, um, the, the video shows it going to 32,000 GPUs, which is like a whole, you know, field of racks. Um, so that's what the, you know, the Microsofts of the world are probably going to look like. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, anybody else got any questions for Elliot? I think you've got a lot of lurkers on the, uh, the, the yeah, the, the well, that's YouTube cool. Video. And the lights just turned off here. So, uh, <laughs> Okay. I, can, I can lurk too. Thanks for the eclipse talk, by the way. I made it to uh, to Maine for that, and uh, it really is a unique experience. I recommend it. Yeah, okay. you need to pay your bills. <laughs> the Wi-Fi is still on. I'm good. I don't. I don't need photons. <laughs> At least visible photons. <laughs> I sometimes get that at the library where I hold my Toastmasters meetings. They're uh... The, the, the room we meet in uh, has the lights on a on the motion sensors. Yeah. So whenever they go out like that, I just wave my hand in the air a little bit and it comes back on. <laughs> okay. Thanks, I, I think we're going to pivot to David Lee. We're, we've got a couple of student cluster okay. contest talks, like really quick ones, just sort of status updates. I think me and Josh, Josh is here from Wentworth. I think him and I will probably talk about some of the, uh, some of the, the, competitions we're involved with as well i i have um if we have some talk some speakers after david and we might we might have the ucsd folks talk again uh once we start talking about student cluster contests so but if you want david you can bring us up to speed on your research i've got some research to discuss with you too like i say i i saw some pretty amazing micron demonstrations at gtc i wasn't out there but they they did about 25 percent or or thereabouts of the content was was streamed. It was virtual, so that that worked out great. Um, but yeah, David, if you have any any updates, feel free to fill us in. A quick presentation. Um, it's short, but it's just the small stuff that we've been working on today, or this semester, really. Yeah, let me just get that. Ooh, can you guys see that? Is that good? Yep. Okay, um, so what what we've been preparing for this whole semester really, um, we haven't had many general meetings just because uh, unfortunately all of our eboard members have been swamped with work. Um, it's like that kind of season for us, but um, we're hoping and we've been planning this throughout the semester, the return of Massachusetts Green Team uh, featuring yours only BU and Northeastern U University. So um, a, bit, a bit ago I reached out back to Professor uh, David Cayley to see if he was willing to have some of his students come help us out for the competition for SC24. Uh, and he had two brilliant volunteers, um, who I'll show later, who will be joining us on our team. Um, so hopefully our process of um, applying for the competition and just preparing goes well. And fingers crossed that we get in so we can have another successful uh, or even more successful uh, year than we did last year. And um, I believe I gave a spiel about this um, back in November, so I'm not gonna talk that much about it, but this is just some recent history of UHPC at SC. Um, so that was that, that. So we've actually been consistently getting in every year, which is pretty nice. But um, I, I guess I wanna, I'd just like to quickly talk about our recent showing on SC23. And we actually had a blog posted from BU about our um, competition, so. Um, it went, honestly, it went pretty well. We didn't get last. I think we were, um, we performed better than we thought we did, given our limitations and not just um, our team, because our, our team wasn't as experienced as it usually has been in the previous times, but uh, we learned a lot from it. And we did have a lot of complications with hardware. So in the in the image sort of far right, the third one, that, that was our computer cluster and it was in a shipment container, but we managed to actually get hold of that I think 36 hours after the competition had officially started because it was stuck somewhere in an Ampere booth. Um, and they didn't let us like, I don't know, it was a really hard 
thing and we were really stressed about that but we did get our computer um had a lot of great time and learned a lot that's the most important thing um so as for our team um this is the current roster that we have prepared so uh Shamra and me um this is our will be our second time competing and we'll have four new members that it's Jason Jiang who's our current treasurer uh he is the youngest on our team he's actually a sophomore right now uh and Emika who is our cluster manager um and we have Hamza and Xander from Northeastern University and they're both ECE one thing to quickly note is all of us are engineers and I think that's the first time that everyone on our team are actually engineering majors and we don't have any computer science majors so that's that um and in terms of preparation for it so I, I I've we've, we've been in contact and weekly meetings have been held for our team and we've just kind of been discussing general ideas about how we should proceed with this because um last year we felt like planning or at least Sean and I felt like planning was a little more over the place so this time around we're kind of centralizing it more with the weekly meetings and um making sure our application is fully fleshed out before we you know start with like hardware preparation but in terms of hardware preparation um we have been fiddling with our home built raspberry pi cluster which thanks to ben i know he's here for like getting that all set up but Sharma and i have been fiddling with that just to get things prepared up uh and also the bu's own shared computing cluster so that's kind of it um not many updates because this semester has been really kind of a drag for most of us here on eboard but uh other than that i guess if there's any questions about how we're doing or our future plans, um, because that will be my last competition. Um, yeah, feel free to shoot out to me. So they've already had some um, open webinars. Is that correct, David, where you can call in and, and I, I think they're talking about the codes that they're going to, to track this year? Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, actually, I thought there was one. Let me go see if um, there may have been one that they did already. Uh, in the meantime, hey David, uh, yeah, how's it looking for the timeline? Did you guys already submit your application, or waiting for results, or what? Uh, we haven't submitted the application yet. We've we're still in the middle of writing the prompts, but I like to say we're at least halfway into the prompts. The deadline is on the 15th of May. So obviously by that time, we'll be we were ramped up for that um, submission date. Nice, good luck this year. Yeah, thank you. All right, I'll look that webinar thing up. I thought they already had one, but it would be pretty early if they've, if they've had one. When's the deadline for a submission? We've, we've got a couple months, right? Yeah, uh, one month actually. It's one in May fifteenth, so not even. It's like 28, oh, wow. 28 days. Okay, yeah, very soon. Okay. Um, hopefully it works out for us though. I'll keep everyone posted. I think I invited some other schools and teams from previous years because remember last time we did this, we had like basically five schools represented, like one or two people from each school. But I don't know if this this probably didn't work out too well this month. Uh, I know Matt Chung's online, but but he's he's not going to do SEC this year. He might uh, might do it when we uh, when we get like a, a Team USA together for the ISC. But that may be a while. Do you got it? Is Matt online? Yeah, he's online. I I am putting together a team for UCR. I mean, like I, we're the U.S. national team thing was for like ISC, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you are putting a, a UCR team together. Great. Yeah. You know what kind of hardware yeah. you're looking? Are you looking at AMD or Intel or any any particular? Um. So we're. So our. I'm. I'm also like a solutions architect at UCR, right? So. For a instructional cluster, we're buying two um, Grace Hopper nodes, which Elliot talked about earlier, um, and we're gonna give those a try. Um, obviously, the the like supposed like ARM um, power efficiency is something we want to test out to see how effective that is, and then we're gonna look for obviously sponsorships, which is probably the 
biggest barrier to you know bring the actual hardware everyone has hardware to bring but being able to actually bring it is a different story um, due to vendor availability and GPU availability of industries and eating all of that up you know so <laughs> Okay. Um, do we have any other student cluster contest folks online? I know um, Josh and I had talked about it at, at Wentworth, uh, but but their season, their their school year is a lot different than most other colleges. So I don't know if that would line up very well for Wentworth. Anyway. Okay, moving along. Um, anybody want to talk before? I was going to talk about the project that Josh and I were working on at at Wentworth that we were going to present this weekend. But we uh, so the the conference we're we're running this weekend is called Latchup Latchup.io. If you want to look at it, L A T C H U P dot I O. Um, him and I were going to do originally a three way presentation. Let me see if I can. I can uh, figure out how to uh, start. There we go. Start screen sharing. Dunk. See if it'll let me do this. So the original plan was we were going to do a um, a three way presentation on uh, uh, universal binaries for uh, you know multiple processors. We had we had a bunch of. Let me navigate down to my my video here. We had a, a couple of use cases, and we had a little bit of prior art, and then we had um, uh, division of effort. It was going to be Josh and Wentworth, myself, and then we also had a researcher at uh, Northeastern University who would have would have really closed the loop with us. I'm not sure why my um, – oh, I know why. I was looking at my Chrome tab rather than everything. Uh, here we go. Share my PowerPoint. Well, you know what I should do? It probably won't let me share PowerPoint. Let me try something different. Maybe I can just share the whole screen and then just pivot over to it. Yeah. I will pivot over to... All right. Yeah, that'll work. I think. Let me give it the old team try. Okay. Nope. Oh, screen sharing failed. <clears throat> uh, give me one more minute, guys, and I'll see if I can. Uh, uh, I suppose I could upload it to a Google Sheet and share it from there start screen sharing window yeah. share yeah i don't think it's gonna let me do this um all right well while i figure out if i can share this another way i can probably pass it off to does anybody else have a short take bill do you have a do you have a, a short take on any any topic no i wasn't going to talk tonight yeah um well i i certainly uh this is a a nice healthy demo or excuse me a nice healthy presentation i just can't seem to get jetsy to let me share it so i'll, I'll figure out if i can do uh uh how else could i possibly share it um oh you know what i could possibly do and uh you know what? This is only about the thousandth time that we've done these conferences, and we always seem to have the same, same bunch of errors cropping up. Okay, let me do this. I'll try to share it. I'll see if I can diagnose. Please reload and try again. Okay, that doesn't mean anything. Um, Security is nice, except when it gets in the way of work. Uh, I'm sorry? Security is all very well and good, except when it gets in the way. You know what I could do? Um, I'm trying to think if I have this online somewhere that I could just 
give you the URL. I can certainly narrate the the story, at least my part. Um, um, hold on, I'm trying to. Oh yeah, like I said, I'm pretty sure I don't have a link. I because I was developing it here on PowerPoint, and I was going to possibly upload it to G Drive or something like that if I needed to before Saturday. But we we already had had taken our presentations off by then. Um, actually, you know what, Josh? Should we talk about BossNet? Do you want? Should we talk about BossNet here? Uh, we could do that. We we can talk about the uh, the hopping at maybe the next blue. Yeah, and by then we'll have you and I'll have our parts done, and our 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 third presenter from Northeastern might as well. Yeah, we should we should have some data and uh, a demo at that. Okay, point. let's do that because we're only about yeah. We're, we're a good couple of three-day weekends away from having uh, not only the presentation buttoned up, but also the functional demo. Um, okay, well, let me find, uh, uh, let me quick and find the URL for BossNet. Now, you have the PDF, right? So maybe, uh, do you want to share the PDF, or, sh or should I just find the, uh, the URL for the... Um... I, don't, I don't have it on this machine right now. Okay, let me see if I can find MIT IoT Net. Uh, yeah, see if this resolves. Because what I will do, I can, I can definitely, I, I can definitely display Chrome tabs. So what I'll do is this: tinyurl.com, and see if, uh, see if this will resolve to the BossNet page. <laughs> It does. Okay. So let me share this and then I, uh, um, if we have to, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll share that link. Okay. So sharing. IOT net. It's about this time for another good IOT net meetup. All right. So, uh, Josh and I are, so, so IOT net was a, um uh, not not really a field test it was more of a lab test of uh agnostic uh, LoRaWAN fielding so the the way you would do an agnostic fielding we modeled this uh substantially after um uh the the old MIT roofnet project so the Ro roofnet project was supposed to prove two things they used this thing called the amos model which is agnostic mesh omniscient star which is to say that you give a bunch of free computers to students and back then so this is 10 15 years ago it was it was a computer they said here's a computer here's a 12 dbi omnidirectional antenna stick it in your window and the good news is like why would you do this the good news is you get free mit bandwidth if you do this and 10 and 15 years ago that was a pretty compelling story the student would say, great, I will live, you know, uh, two kilometers off campus. Like, like as you can see there, there's a, it's a little strip map of Boston with, with one of the nodes in it and the coverage area. I mean, the, the, the I ideal coverage area, certainly Bill can tell you, you never get a, a, a true circle <laughs> with an omnidirectional antenna. Uh, but, uh, they the the quid pro quo was the developers of roofnet could log on to your computer while you were at school and then you you could do anything you wanted with it at night and back then i mean you were getting uh as much as you could get out of uh this this is before uh, 11a and it was probably uh, before 11g anyway you were you were getting uh you know t 10 megabits per second let's say 11 megabits per second, which was, which was damn good back then for free. Um, you, uh, you know, you could, you could stream video uh, for the sites that were doing that back then. It was, it was a great deal. So everybody that was within range of the, of the big powerful 
22 dB uh, omnidirectional antenna on the top of uh, of building 32 uh, could could uh, set up one of these roofnet nodes, talk to uh, the the centralized node or uh, the aggregator. Uh, they call them sinks. I know at, at roofnet had different terms for everything, um, and you'd you'd be able to then uh, get if if you were in a really good location, uh, a single hop uh, uh, drop back into the internet. Now, the whole part with this research project was, uh, why don't we give these things away for free? And if people don't have direct line of sight to the, to the top of the green building or, or the, or building 32 at MIT, they will be able to hop via this, this, uh, this, this algorithm that they came up with and published. I mean, that was what the research was for was to find this ad hoc wireless mesh network thing where you just just gave everybody who wanted bandwidth free computers and they just put them in their window. That was the level of install that was expected from this program. And they, they to a great extent, uh, managed to to get to that level. So what we did as, a, as an add-on to that was we came out with IoT Net, which would allow you to then put uh, these LoRaWAN nodes much in the same fashion, much in this the same Amos uh, fielding technique to to then get LoRaWAN capability. Um, the difference with this model is, you know, you didn't have a PC sitting in your window on house current. The LoRaWAN nodes were much less power. They uh, they were either uh, like like most of the time when you buy a LoRaWAN node, it, it it's on like a 12 volt SBC or something. Uh, the ones we were looking at had a button selling them they were remember you used to be able to buy these these uh these buttons from amazon where you could order dash soap they were they were just they were just called the the do it button or whatever so that so we put a lot of these uh LoRaWAN, uh transceivers in there and they'd run off of uh you know the 3.3 or 5 volt uh button cells so last year, Josh and I said, okay, well, let's take this to the next log logical extension, which is uh, uh, bandwidth anywhere in Boston, whenever you need it. What you would do is you're walking around town. The, the usage case we demoed for IoT Net was you're walking over close to a red line stop. And because you're on LoRaWAN and because of the physics of, of the LoRaWAN protocol and the radio um, capabilities, you'd be within range it would know it it would say okay this guy's five minutes from the t station probably 30 minutes from getting home so let's turn up his uh nest thermostat so the way you would do all that glue code now so so that particular proof of concept was was intended to demonstrate uh the the passive nature of this this model you would have a laura wan dongle by this point here again we haven't done this yet all we've all we've done is is lab tests with a little bit of field testing, but but we didn't totally trick out a network. You would have some sort of dongle with LoRa uh, radio on it. It would probably be on your keychain, and then you, whenever you walked by a LoRa device, you'd be able to get a couple of location-based services out of it. Um, and one of those that that exact tortured uh, uh, demo I told you about, someone actually did that. There's a website called uh, If This Then That ifttt.org. So what you do is you you set up uh, a trigger and you set up uh, you know an event, and all the plumbing in between ha is handled by things like this network, which is to say that you register your MAC address with uh, the Things Network, and you get into your dashboard and you set up all these connections, and from then on out everything theoretically will be passive. And I think that's what Josh and I want to do with BossNet, because if we can glue this this sort of dog's breakfast of of RF that we now have still functioning and still free in Cambridge and Boston, plenty of RoofNet nodes out there that the city of Cambridge have installed, and they're not using them so much for the Cambridge public internet anymore, uh, which probably peaked a decade ago, uh, but they're still functional. Uh, the uh, Outdoor nodes in nice watertight NEMA boxes with um, 12 dBi antennas. They, uh, you know, they're not all working, but some of them are. And then there's there's many other things that we can get sort of uh, 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 bandwidth from 
from previous incarnations of this. Uh, I think uh, it was called the Ricochet Network. Those nice little uh, dish antennas. The we can get some bandwidth out of those. Uh, but we'd have to install all of this LoRaWAN. Uh, this it it's quite possible that there is a a large LoRaWAN network out there that we haven't tapped into yet, because since about five years ago, all the new Comcast modems uh, have LoRaWAN built in. Uh, so if you if you've gotten uh, a Verizon service, Xfinity, um, excuse me, uh, Xfinity is Verizon, right? Well. Um, no, vice versa. Okay. Xfinity is craptastic. Okay, so so if you've gotten a new cable modem uh, in in the last five years, if you've got new service and they and they did some on premise equipment at your house, it's got a lower WAN chip in it. Now they haven't turned it on yet. I don't think they they see the business model. Uh, maybe we could convince them that this would be a great uh, uh, university test bed. That's kind of what what Josh and I have been pitching. Um, yeah, that's correct. Surprisingly, a large amount of the IoT consumer home devices actually have uh, some level of connectivity that is not uh, being used. So if we can have a crossover, we should have a pretty decent uh, and robust uh, mesh network. Yep. Um, I think so we have so we have written a couple of papers. And we have applied to a couple of conferences. Now we haven't applied for grants yet, and we may not need them. This gear is is pretty cheap. We we own quite a bit of of stuff. It just needs to be disassembled, reassembled, probably soldered. It may make for a a, a couple of hackathons, but but I think we could so, probably yeah, fill because so you you need to do the grant the uh, grants first. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or, well, we were hoping to get the grants after our first paper, but we haven't gotten a paper accepted yet. <laughs> yeah, we'll probably be doing one of the, the Linux Foundation mentorships, though, over the summer as well, uh, which has some amount of funding associated with it. 